Thank you for joining today's webinar, Are Your Lambs Not Doing? My name is Jodie Rizzo O'Brien and I'm one of the Sheep Connect SA team. So Sheep Connect is supported by Australian Wool Innovation, the South Australian Sheep Industry Fund and the Department of Primary Industries and Regions. For more information on Sheep Connect, you can go to our website, sheepconnect.com.au and you can follow us on Twitter at Sheep Connect SA. Tonight's webinar has been recorded and we'll upload the recording to Sheep Connect SA YouTube channel in the coming days. We welcome you to revisit the webinar yourself and share it with friends. Tonight's presenter is Emma Shaddock. Emma is the Livestock Production Advisor based at Burrow. She covers both the central, northern and western parts of South Australia. Just like to welcome Emma to tonight's presentation. Thanks, Emma. Lovely, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you for the introduction. Um, covered that fairly well so I've been working as a livestock production advisor with elders for I think it's about eight years now um just up front I'm not a vet we are going to cover a few topics that do verge into that vet territory a little bit and we've got um Steph Warwick on the webinar as well who can help us out with some questions in that field if we need so thank you Steph um, so are your lambs not doing? This is certainly how most of my phone calls have started nearly for the last two months now. It's been quite a challenging spring and summer on the back of what was a challenging year last year, especially for lambs, but for livestock. Um, so we'll have a little bit of a look today. What are we seeing at the minute? So um, all of my calls will cover all of these, but most of them will tick a few, at least two, three or four off the list. So largely we've got lambs that um, don't look well. They've either lost an awful lot of weight or we've seen lower than expected growth rates. So they're not going backwards, but they're not going forwards either. Um, a lot of the time we've got scouring going with this and they can be quite lethargic. Um, we have had a reasonable amount of deaths reported. And in some cases, we're seeing a lot more scabby mouth than normal um, and anemia in a few lambs as well. So there's lots going on um, and it's certainly something we need to get back on top of. So today I want to step through firstly a bit of background. So how we ended up where we are at the minute, how these lambs have been so challenged that they're having all these illnesses and troubles. And then we'll step into what might actually be going on. So some of the common causes I'm seeing around the place um, and how they've come about. And then finally, we'll look at a few practical steps we can take to try and get these lambs back on track and going forwards and gaining weight again. Okay, so firstly, how did we get here? Um, this is all going to be probably a little more specific for some of the areas I cover in South Australia, but I think a lot of it does relate across the whole state um, and not everyone has faced all of these challenges but again quite a few have been at play so for some areas I really think it started this time last year with those really big summer rains and they were enough um, to get some of those especially worm burdens kicked off so we did have a bit of worm trouble in those areas that got rain this time last year um, and so we started the year with higher worm burdens on our pastures than what we normally would have so it was all set up there ready for the right conditions um right and then following that depending which area you're in a lot had a pretty dry start some didn't get rain until june july even august so we had a lot of lambs that were born on dry feed very limited feed um to use that already doing it quite tough um and we did see a lot of coccidiosis and things like that at the time too that went with those challenges of not having green feed until basically spring in some areas. So that did put a lot of pressure on ewes and lambs um, and just put them on the back foot, I think, just from the start. When it finally did start raining, um, it didn't really stop. So we saw an awful lot of rain, spring rains, especially through October and November. And with this, we're seeing a lot of lower quality feed. So we had a lot grow, um, but there were certainly plenty of cases where that feed just wasn't testing as well as what it looked. So it looked like we had lots of even clovers and medics and things like that, but um, a lot of the time they were pretty high in fibre and not didn't have the same energy level as normal. 
So we've got animals that aren't getting that nutritional level that we'd normally bank on. Um, so that's still putting them under pressure. Heading back into the last few months, um, with all that spring rain meant a lot of areas were a good month behind with harvest. So where we'd normally be able to um, drench lambs onto stubbles earlier in the year, this got delayed. So pastures were, some of them were getting a little more overgrazed while we're waiting for stubbles. Um, and that also delayed those cleaner paddocks that we had as well. So more time for those worms and other parasites to breed up and take over. Um, and when we're talking lambs, we're also talking generally our highest risk animals on the property. Um, so with all of this that's been going on in the background, all we really needed to do was add a bit of stress, whether it was weaning, change of feed, different weather conditions, um, and everything really just took off. Um, and I did hear a good analogy the other day. It was actually quite like the challenges we've seen with cropping. Um, we're chasing a lot of in, yeah, rust and all sorts of bugs and everything in crops, and it was no different with the lambs as well. They were getting faced with all those parasites as well. So when I'm talking about those high-risk animals, there's a few different factors that will determine how susceptible an animal is um, to disease. And you'll see a lot of the time we're ticking off at least half of the things on this list. So certainly age is one. Lambs have a lot more naive immune system than what um, an older ewe does. So they are more susceptible to things. Um, nutrition is the next one. So for on some of those pastures that aren't meeting our demands like we'd hope, um, we're certainly going to be behind. Uh, disease status, which sounds a little backwards, but um, a lot of the time, and I have seen it a lot in the last few months, those animals have been challenged with one thing like worms and that set them back and then they've picked up something else like your scabby mouth as well. Um, so it, just that immune system is under so much pressure. Stress we've already touched on and genetics can play a bit of a part too. So you can sort of start to see a picture now about how we ended up in the situation we did despite having what's generally considered a good spring. So to talk a little bit more now about some of these low energy pastures, um, really it was a perfect storm. So we had lots of rain, pretty rank pastures, so higher in fibre than normal, which limits then the intake of those animals so they're eating less. We also got a lot of rain around the time that those plants dried off. Um, especially in the earlier areas, they copped most of that spring rain as the pastures were drying off. Um, and for some areas, spray topping as well. So plenty of pastures were spray topped, um, even vetch and things like that where we were having fly troubles. And then we got all the rain on it, so that's leached out a lot of the sugars in the plant um, and some of the minerals and things as well. So just to give you a couple examples here, um, this is a pasture that was cut in the mid-north in late October. Um, looked to be reasonable feed. You can see the grasses have run up to head, but that clover is still quite fresh and there was plenty of it out there. Um, but when we got that feed test back, a um, couple of things to point out that neutral detergent fibre, which is that fibre I was referring to before, is reasonably high for where that pasture is. And in particular, our uh, energy levels, that last line down the bottom there of 8.1, while it's not terrible, we would have thought that that pasture would be more like 9 or 10 megajoules. So what this means is even for a dry ewe, a 60 kilo ewe, she's probably going to only be able to eat enough to maintain her weight. Um, so you can imagine if we're putting lambs on here that need that extra energy for growth, um, 35 kilo lamb um, eating maybe 700 or a bit more grams of this a day. In dry matter, we're still only looking maybe just under six megajoules a day, which really isn't going to be enough to get any growth rate of any significance out of them. Um, so, yeah, this is, I guess, where it all started. Um, where we've moved into is sort of this example here. So this is a medic pasture which did dry off towards the start of all those rains so it caught the worst of it um 
at this point, I think this test was done maybe early December. So after all those rains had been through, but the lambs on here really were battling. Um, and so when we got the feed test back on here, you can see now that neutral detergent fiber at nearly 70% is really gonna, they're gonna battle to eat enough. So those 35 kilo lambs now might be only eating maybe 600 grams a day, which isn't much. Um, and you can see that's reflected in that digestibility as well of around 30%. So for every yeah kilo or 600 grams that those lambs are eating, they're actually only really digesting and using 30%. The other 70 is going to pass through. But the most significant part of this feed test is that energy again. Um, we're looking at only three and a half megajoules. So to put this in perspective, um, a cereal straw, um, they are a bit less this year, but quite often we're working on six and a half to seven megajoules. So this medic pasture is already half as bad. Look, it's getting half of that. So these poor little lambs now um, will be battling to get two megajoules a day on this. So we're going to see some pretty rapid weight loss and probably some diseases come along pretty quickly with that. Okay, so what are some of the things that we're seeing going on with all these lambs? Uh, first and foremost, the most common problem around the place has been the high worm burden. Um, I've seen quite a few egg counts now across a few regions, and I've put this table up here not to take as gospel, but just to put it a little bit in perspective. Um, properties do range a fair bit depending on when they've drenched and um when they've weaned and things like that how much rain they've had uh but consistently in the last couple of months we've been seeing counts well up over 2000 and in some of these are traditionally pretty low worm areas so like those um pastoral areas and around goiter's line so that's put an awful lot of pressure on lambs now some of these counts have been higher again in areas where barber's pole worm has been a problem um, but I did get a test back the other day with a count of 3,000 eggs per gram and that was uh, almost entirely black scour worm. So it's been a fantastic year for them as well. Um, some of this, I think, has been largely due to reinfection and we've certainly seen that for anything that had a drench probably early November. I went back onto pastures, it kept raining, perfect conditions for larval survival. And we were seeing high counts again six, eight weeks later. Uh, we're also, because of those conditions, getting a high pasture burden. So it's been a lot easier for animals to pick up worms because there's been an awful lot more on the ground. Um, and in those pastoral areas as well, there's a lot more sheep grazing water courses and things like that rather than being spread out over the entire property like they normally would be. Emma, okay. sorry, I just have yep. a question. Um, we just go back to that previous slide. What um, sort of, you know, what number should be people looking at for the maximum for their worm egg counts? Yeah, for People okay. that are not familiar with them? Yeah, if we're not talking um, about Barber's Pole, because we'll talk more about that one in a minute, but your tolerance levels are a little bit higher. Um, generally for lambs through the sheep cropping zone, Counts of around 250, 300, um, and probably, yeah, around 300 in the pastoral areas. And for ewes, it's more like 400, especially if they're going on stubbles or, again, pastoral ewes. So when we're starting to talk, talk six, 800, and then into the 2000s, we're well and truly over that drenching threshold. Um, right, so this probably leads pretty well into this. Which worms are we actually seeing? And I did mention a few of these. With sheep, there's probably a top three would be certainly Barber's pole worm. We're going to look at that one a little more on its own in a minute. Um, and small brown stomach worm. So both of them are found in the abomasum or the last or the fourth stomach of a sheep. And then if we move into the small intestine, that's where we're finding those big um, black scale worm burdens as well. So um, that's sort of the parts of the sheep that these worms are in. Um, and a little bit about how they get into a sheep because um, I have had that question a little bit as well. So essentially we've got um, 
larvae living on the pasture, a sheep will come along and ingest those larvae. Inside the sheep, they'll turn into adults um, and then start laying eggs. So that process there takes two and a half, three weeks roughly. Um, once those adults are laying eggs, they'll be passed out in the dung back onto the pasture and go through a few larval stages before they're ready to be ingested by sheep again. So really when we're thinking worms in the sheep, that's only a part of the picture. Um, we've also got another week or so where of that life cycle where those larvae existing on the pasture. So that becomes quite important when we're thinking about about um, what drenches to use and things like that, rather than just what those individual animals have been drenched with before. We need to think a bit bigger picture and look at what sort of drenches have been used on that property um, or even further, if we're buying sheep in, what's been used on the property where those sheep have come from because that's what those um, worms have been exposed to. Okay, so a little more background here um, and I guess to put it in perspective why the worm burns are still where they're at in a lot of areas in January is how long those um, larvae are able to survive on the pastures. So this graph is for Barber's pole worm um, at 60% humidity but it's going to give us a bit of an idea of the trend. So you can see if we're talking days of around 25 degrees we're going to get a 90% reduction in larvae over probably two and a half to three months. So it's quite a long time until those pastures are getting back down to quite low levels of larvae. Uh, as the temperature um, increases, those larvae burn up energy a bit quicker and will die a bit quicker. And then once we're getting temperatures over 40 degrees, that's actually you know, like hot and dry, is becoming less conducive to larval survival so they can die quite quickly. So in those sort of conditions, if we're consistently getting over 40 degrees and no rain um, for a period of one to two weeks, we might get that 90% reduction. So if you think about the summer we've had, which in a lot of places there's been a day of 40 here and there, um, where I'm sitting at the minute it hasn't hit 20 degrees today. So it's been quite good for those larvae to stay on pastures um, and continue breeding. Okay, so looking at uh, these are those three species I was talking about before. The first one is the small brown stomach worm. Uh, then we've got the trikes, which are your black scour, and the final one in orange there is your barber's pole worm. This is sort of their ideal temperature range they like to live in um, and why we see so much trouble with barber's pole worm in wet summers because it does like it warmer um, but if you think about the temperatures that we've had over summer so far which largely have been between that 25 and 35 degrees we've had certainly perfect conditions for barber's pole but also good conditions for all of those worms so they've been able to survive and carry on breeding and cause some pretty big infection rates so Barber's Pole, I said we would touch on this one on its own. And the reason for this is unlike your other scour worm, so black scour, small brown stomach, this one's a blood sucker. Um, so we'll cause sheep to deteriorate quite quickly and we do get a lot of anemia. So as you can see in that picture there, the pink bit that's usually inside their eyelid and around the eye is white and their gums will be the same. Uh, actually does look quite bizarre. Um, and this is because those worms essentially in those sheep dry blood for want of an easier prescription. Um, how this one gets so nasty so quickly as well is those females can lay up to 10,000 eggs per day. So to put this one into perspective, something like your black scow worm might only be laying one or 200 eggs per day. So it breeds up very quickly. And why when I was talking before about egg counts and drenching tolerances, they can be a little different for Barber's Pole. Other things you might see, a lot of the sheep are quite lethargic. Um, we did mention the anemia, uh, certainly a high death rate and um, something called bottle jaw as well, which you can also see in that picture where under the jaw of the sheep there's a, a fluidy swelling, sort of like jelly if you tap it, um, and that's a sign of protein loss as well. So not only associated with barber's pole but definitely one of the symptoms of barber's pole.
the other important thing to note here is that a lot of sheep with barber's pole worm, if that's the only worm that's there, they won't always, they won't scour. Um, that's something that's associated with the other types of worms. And a lot of the time you can have a mix of two or three or more as well. Okay, changing tact. Um, some of the other stuff I've seen pop up, um, certainly had reports through the Mid-North, heard of cases in the Mallee, and that's um, salmonella infections, so a bacterial infection. This one's really nasty, so if you do suspect this, get in touch with your vet as soon as you can. Um, so what you're seeing with these animals is they quite often have a fever, they have a really severe watery diarrhea so it's more or less water coming out the back end um get really dehydrated and die and we're talking big death rates with some of these um, infections so they'll pick up the bacteria um through eating it or drinking it on contaminated feed um and then those animals with the infection will shed it back out um in their feces as well so um, there is also some animals that can carry the infection without any symptoms, so they'll just be shedding the bacteria back into the environment, and that's probably been the precursor for where we've got to. Um, certainly young animals and anything under stress or under pressure is more prone to this, so it's why we see it more often in lambs. And again, going back to what we are saying at the start of this webinar, why we're seeing a lot more of it this year. Um, because we are getting those high worm burdens, some of your cold, wet, windy weather. Um, if we go back a couple months as well, just all of that pressure and stress drops the immune system, lets these bacteria take over. So I guess one more point on that is um, if you're handling these animals with salmonella, be careful because um, people can get infected with it as well. And that can be pretty nasty. So Keep your hygiene practices up um, and definitely call a vet. It's usually an antibiotic or a specific course of antibiotics um, to get back on top of that one. All right, just to touch on a few of the other things we've seen around the place. I have heard of a case of E. coli, so following similar paths to the salmonella infection. Plenty of scabby mouth, probably more than normal, I would say, and I think that's um, a bit of a sign of how run down some of these lambs are. I'm starting to get a few more cases now of respiratory disease, especially in lambs as they're starting to get shut up. So a lot of coughing and quite often a bit of pink eye to go with it. Um, so we're getting yet lung damage and sometimes deaths there. And the other thing to look out for, which I guess we'll start to see more of as we're using more of the hay and things that were produced this year, are mycotoxins. So these are toxins produced by um, moulds on the feed, which we've got plenty of this year. So not all moulds produce mycotoxins that are going to be a problem for sheep and cattle, but there's definitely some nasty ones out there that are testing at higher levels than what we'd normally see. So something to keep an eye out for as well. All right, so that's probably enough of the doom and gloom. Let's have a look at some of the actions we can take to go forwards and get back on top of things. Uh, firstly, um, take a closer look. So I've had a lot of conversations with producers, probably more so over harvest because there's a lot going on where they haven't checked their lambs for a week or they've driven past them in the paddock and they've looked okay, but it wasn't until they got them in the yards to weigh them that they realised they really haven't grown despite being on good feed um, or they were actually worse than they looked when they got up close. So, yeah, first and foremost, go out and just take a closer look, just make sure you're on track. Um, and then if you're seeing anything weird, wonderful, those really severe scours, high death rates, get in touch with a vet because some of those, especially salmonella cases, um, the sooner you can get on top of them, uh, the better, the lower your death rates. There's been some pretty big losses with those sort of infections. Um, other things, get a worm egg count done. So if you're not sure if it is worms or not, this can be a good way to see what's there. Um, collect a few fresh samples of feces from the mob um, and get them checked to find out what the worm burden might be. 
And if you're suspecting Barber's pole, get a culture done as well. So this is where they go and hatch out those eggs because um, a lot of them, the eggs look the same for those species and they'll then work out what percentage of which worms in there. And if it's Barber's pole, we can start looking at some strategies to get back on top of that one as well. So if you're getting counts above that threshold, make sure we're drenching with an effective drench. So that's one that will kill 95% or more of the worms in those animals. So I wanted to chuck this in here quickly um, because we are seeing the need to drench in areas that aren't that often drenching with some of these actives. So we don't have a lot of different drench groups. Um, those ones in the colour there, are the diff like the red and the orange, are your different drench groups. And you can see since the 60s, we've had five. So we want to make sure the ones we've got are working quite well. Um, <clears throat> so your white drenches, they're the first ones that came out. So there is a lot of resistance to them around the place. The clears came out about 15 years later. Um, and then the first of your mectins, which is ivermectin, came out in the 80s. So because these have been around the longest, we've also seen the most resistance on properties to these. Um, a little bit newer are the stronger versions of the mectins, particularly moxidectin, which is the strongest of the family. And then it wasn't until after 2010 that we got um, Zolvix, which is your monopantal, and then StarTech a bit later on, which is your Tequantal um, with abomectin in it. So make sure you're using a dredge um, that's working on your property. You can do another egg count that 10 to 14 days after drenching to compare back to get an idea of how well those drenches are working. Um, and best practice now as well is to use a combination of actives. So if there's resistance to one, hopefully there's a different active in there that will kill those worms. Uh, another great source of information, if you've got more questions, there's some great tools on there, um, drench decision guides um, about, you know, when to get the drench gun out and when not to is the Worm Boss website. So some really good stuff on there. Um, strongly recommend having a look at. They've got stuff on there for flies and mice as well. Right, uh, a few other things, um, getting your diet right. So some of the times it has just been that the feed has nothing in it anymore. So get that. If, if in doubt, get a feed test done, send that off and find out what's really going on. But making sure we've got particularly lambs on a high energy, high protein diet. Again, the barbers pole infections, getting some protein back in there is pretty important. And balancing out all those minerals as well. So um, if they are, have been quite sick, you don't want to push them too hard too early, but we do need to ease them back onto a pretty good diet to get them back on track. Um, final point I want to make here is in regards to pre-lambing, which is creeping up pretty quickly now. Um, because of the high worm burdens we're seeing on pastures, it's going to be pretty important to identify now which paddocks you want to land down into and then take some steps to try and reduce those worm burdens in there, whether it's spelling paddocks, saving some fresh doubles for lambing and not putting sheep in them yet, um, using some crash grazing techniques with drenching to try and just cut down those worm burdens because while we said that older animals do have a bit more natural resistance to worms, once we throw lambing in the mix, um, that drops their natural resistance levels as well and we're quite often set stock for a bit longer, so picking up a lot more worms. Um, so important to get that right so we don't get hit with worms again at the start of lambing. And that's all from me. So thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. Um, yeah, and hopefully we're starting to get some of these lambs going forwards again. Thanks. Thanks, Emma. So we've got a few questions that have been submitted by the audience and we'll get through as many of those questions um, as time allows. And as Emma said, she's had plenty of questions from producers over um, the last couple of weeks, couple of months. Um, so here's your opportunity. We've got, yeah. we've got, we've got Emma online. Um, and we also have Stephanie, um, who's a vet with elders, to um, if there's any specific veterinary questions, um, she's online and able to answer those. So we've got a couple of questions about salmonella um, to start off with, Emma. Um, yep. The first one is how quickly, we talked about that you can often see quite rapid deaths in those animals. How quickly are those animals likely to, um, you know, to die? How quickly does yeah. that you know, happen? 
um, I will throw a step in a minute, but some of the cases I've seen were within days. So the first day, um, you know, quite often they hadn't been checked for a while. You come out and you notice half a dozen dead. The next day there's another 40 dead is sort of the cases I've been seeing. So really rapid death. But um, is that what you would say is pretty characteristic, Steph? Yeah, absolutely. I think it does occur quickly enough that you will see apparently sudden death, as in last time you went into the paddock, they were fine and you've gone back a day or two later and you will find sudden death. But you should normally also see, you know, perhaps the tail in the mob or a a small percentage, sometimes a large percentage that is starting to scour and look quite hollow in the guts. So so generally with salmonella, you'll have some dead, but you also have a proportion of quite sick looking sheep as well. Excellent. The next one about salmonella um, is, are we able to test, we talk about feed testing for, you know, nutritional purposes. Are we able to test our feed pastures for the presence of salmonella at threshold levels? Oh, that is a good uh, question. No. <laughs> no, you can't. Not We don't have any readily available uh, tests that can do that. In my experience, I think what Em mentioned about having carrier sheep is probably uh, the most you know, likely way an infection gets into a flock. So I think that most farms probably have a few ewes that have a little bit of salmonella in their guts uh, at all times. That's not causing them any issues. Um, and so I think it's constantly in the environment from, from that sort of source. Uh, but then when obviously the lambs are getting stressed or if we are feeding out and feeding in the same area every time or we have, you know, congregation around troughs, you know, there can be some hygiene issues there that can sort of exacerbate the spread. Yeah, great. Question here and um, from one of the, um, that's just coming online, um, what are the strategies that producers can use if they've got wormy sheep, wormy paddocks, perfect storm, and capsules, um, of course, are no longer available? Any ideas there from Steph, Emma? Uh, yep. So, um, yeah, certainly capsules coming off the market has been a challenge. So it's only left us with a long-acting injection, which is solely your um, boxydectin. So it's a single active drench. Um, want to be quite careful when using these because with these injections, there's different payout periods for different types of worms. So really important to get that culture done, work out what's there. Um, for example, you might have a 45-day claim for black scour worm and a 90-day claim for your others. So really wish if we're going to be using them um doing an account at the time but then you want to be doing one every month and once we're starting to see those uh, worm eggs come back go in with a effective oral drench as an exit drench otherwise we're getting a long period of um, a sublethal dose of the chemical and we're going to um, get our drench resistance occurring a lot faster um i think quite often steph explains this quite well but some of the other strategies to well is trying to find paddocks to um, clean up. So we've got that period, if you remember, between when a sheep eats a larvae um, to when it's uh, in that egg-laying stage of that, I think it's 18 to 21 days. So there is strategies there where you can drench your sheep, put them out in a paddock and crash graze it essentially for two or three weeks and then move them on. So in that time they haven't put any more contamination at pastures and sort of backing up what's there. But we want to be doing that with a lot more tolerant animals. Um, other strategies, and this is quite often where the sheep cropping zone gets away with it, is um, we've got periods of time, significant periods of time, where those um, paddocks aren't seeing any grazing at all with cropping systems. Um, and I did fail to mention that before. With your worms, um, rough rule of thumb is three months over summer or six months over winter to get that 90% reduction in larvae. Um, and in some of your drier areas, just take a month off that, so two and five, um, which is what we get with cropping through winter. Um, other options are yeah, hay, pasture innovations. I guess I work in higher rainfall areas typically than, than M, so we do 
a lot of worm testing. Yeah, I would have said that um, and this, question I, yeah, certainly, come, this question has come from a high rainfall area. Certainly from uh, what I'm doing with a lot of guys now is is doing worm testing, even though most of the ewes in particular look quite well. We're worm testing and then if we do have, you know, even a moderately high count, maybe 100 eggs per gram, we know it's not causing production loss, but we, if we know that burden's there, then we can consider a second summer drench. So basically what we're trying to do is stop any ewes carrying those worms over into next autumn and, and winter and into the lambing season. So we're trying to be quite hot on our drenching and yeah, using a second summer drench potentially shortly. Um, and then, yeah, if we need to, we're considering using a long acting drench prior to lambing. If we know we've had big issues last year and lots of contamination, but like Em said, if we are using a long acting drench, then we are trying to do regular we're made counts after we've given it um, and being prepared that we may have to come in with a oral drench when the effect of the long acting drench starts to wear off. And that sometimes can be quite a bit shorter than what it says on the package, uh, depending on whether you've used that on your farm before. Excellent. That's a perfect segue um, to the next question, which is about where and what are the costs of worm egg counts and um, cultures? Uh, yep. So there are a few labs around that do them. Paratech is one. Uh, a lot of vets do them. I do a few for my elders' clients. Um, and I think down the southeast, um, they do some there as well uh, with a special machine that does them rather than doing them under the microscope. So generally, um, yeah, talk to us at elders or um, talk to your vet and get some of them done cost-wise, does vary a little bit on who's doing them um, and with what machines or microscopes they're doing. Um, can vary anywhere from 25 bucks. Uh, I did hear 80 bucks a mob the other day at the vet. Um, cultures are a bit more again and do take a bit longer because those eggs have to be hatched out. Um, and I think you're looking more like 90 bucks for a culture. Does that sound like what you're saying, Steph? Yeah, that sounds right to me. Yep. And um, the other thing, Emma mentioned the Parabos website. There's also a list of um, people that are accredited to do worm egg counts um, and the laboratories are also listed on that website. Um, and that is probably yep. a good answer to the, the next question I had, and I'm happy for you guys to expand on it, is how do we know which drench is going to be the most effective and is there any pre-testing we should maybe do before we uh, highlight that drench? Yeah, I mean, best practice is going to be to do a full drench resistance test. So this is where you'll get in um, a mob of sheep. They do have to have a certain level of worm burden going into it um, and then split them up into little groups. Each group will get a different drench. Um, so you're testing them before and then come back that 10 to 14 days afterwards and test them and see what's left hopefully there's nothing and your drench is working well um we often do I guess a shorter version of that where whichever drench we're using on the property at that time we'll just do a egg count which of course is only a percentage of the mob at random before we drench and then 10 to 14 days after and cross check and that'll give us a, a pretty good idea of how well those drenches are working so as to which one to use um, one that's killing at least 95% of your worms is the answer, and that will depend on the drench history, either on your property or where those sheep have come from and what those worms have been exposed to. Fantastic. Thank you. I just want to thank everyone for joining in today's webinar. Emma, I thank you for sharing your insight and expertise and being able to run this webinar at quite short notice when we've um, this issue has become widespread across the state. Um, Steph, thank you for um, jumping on and helping with the Q&A tonight. Much appreciated. If anyone online has any additional questions, you can contact us directly using the contact information on your webinar registration. We thank you for your time and have a wonderful evening. Mm -hmm.